Uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 3. We continue to work our way through John's gospel. I know a lot of people are on uh, vacation for spring break and want to continue to pray, uh, pray for their safety and, and refreshment. Pastor Adam and Sarah are gone as well, uh, celebrating their 10-year wedding anniversary and uh, been praying for them. Uh, John chapter 3, we're going to cover verses 16 through 21. When I first entered pastoral ministry, I was serving at a church just outside of the Chicagoland area, and uh, one of my responsibilities was college ministries. And we had this ministry, college ministry, that met on Sunday uh, afternoon, Sunday evenings, and it was growing, which was a miracle to me because being brand new in ministry and brand new in that area, I really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I, I, I struggled to try to figure out the best way to approach this ministry. Um, I was probably the worst college pastor ever. We didn't do anything creative at all. We didn't have any uh, uh, coffee pour-over parties, which I know are big now. We didn't have any uh, puppy petting excursions. We just sort of got together and talked theology and read the scriptures and, and talked about relationships. And, and again, by God's grace, this, this ministry started to grow and more and more people started to come, and, and people started to bring their friends. And I even had one man who got a hold of me, a guy by the name of Phil, who was a student in a neighboring town, and he wanted to meet with me to learn what we were doing, he said. And I knew that this was probably a guy's. It wasn't really why he wanted to meet. He wanted to meet to confront me on the, uh, the Bible translation we were using, the dreaded NIV in his uh, estimation. And I knew a little bit about the church that this guy came from. He came from a very legalistic church where they were very concerned about hair length and what people wore and what Bible translation they used and what people ate and drank when they were away from church. And this really consumed a lot of their teaching. But this guy, Phil, he heard about our college group. He wanted to meet with me. So we scheduled a meeting and I drove to, to meet him at Applebee's. I still remember pulling in the parking lot. I got there a few minutes early. And as I waited, I saw kind of flying into the parking lot this silver Buick that had inside the car, all along the, the sides of the windows, were posted uh, these big white boards or poster boards on which was written John 3.16. The first thing I thought was, this has to be dangerous. This guy can't even see out of any of his side windows. But all in, in, along his, uh, the windows of his car was, uh, were these poster boards with John 3.16 on them. We, uh, Phil and I had a, a great lunch that day, and what I, what I saw in my conversation with this man, this young man, 21-year-old, was a guy who was wrecked by guilt, a guy who didn't believe that, he, that God actually really loved him. He thought he just couldn't keep the rules, and there were tons of rules. He couldn't keep all the rules. He lived in a perpetual state of guilt, and as we developed a friendship, um, began to talk more over the, over the phone, would occasionally meet, God actually miraculously delivered Phil from his enslavement to legalism. Phil discovered grace, and it wrecked him in a different way. For the first time, he realized that God actually liked him, that God wasn't keeping a scorecard of his disobedience and holding it over him. What I feared, though, was that even though Phil had John 3.16 posted in his car. He didn't really understand it at all. He didn't understand the nature of God's love contained in that verse. This morning, we're going to look at a section that begins with John 3.16, the, the verse I mentioned, the most quoted, the most uh, beloved, perhaps, the most recited, the most memorized verse in all of Scripture. But again, sometimes I wonder just how often we actually take this verse to heart. So again, we're going to cover verses 16 through 21, but we'll spend most of our time on John 3, 16, where we're going to see the magnitude of God's love. That's the first thing we'll see. The second thing, the benefit of love's gift and the result of receiving God's love. So the magnitude of God's love, the benefit of love's gift, and the result of receiving God's love. John 3, 16, the Word of God reads this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him 
is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. Now, I want to start with a confession. This was a very, very difficult sermon to prepare for, if I'm just being candid with you. Because when we talk about the love of God, we're talking about a subject, we're talking about a doctrine that is so huge, it's so expansive, it's so central to the story of the Bible that there are all kinds of things that can be said, obviously, about that. And there are all kinds of directions that we can go when we talk about the love of God. Because when the Bible talks about the love of God, there there are different aspects of God's love that are presented. There are different dimensions of God's love, different expressions of God's love, different objects of God's love. And so, again, there's so many different roads that we can go down when we start the conversation about God's love. But I think whatever statements we read about God's love must remain tethered to the immediate context in which we read them. And here, again, this is the context, as you recall, of this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. We've, we've broken it down, broken it up into three different weeks, but it's one conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And I think whatever we, we learn about God's love in this section must be considered in light of that conversation. And in this conversation... We're told by Jesus that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. So first, I want to look at the magnitude of God's love. Jesus says it extends to the whole world, for God so loved the world. Now, who's the world here? Well, it would be very possible, in fact, even easy, For us to allow our theological system to override what appears to be the clear meaning of the text. What is who who's represented by the world here? Well, throughout John's gospel, the word, the Greek word cosmos, from which we get the word world, refers to the totality of fallen and corrupt mankind. So all of sin cursed humanity. In fact, Just a few chapters later, John writes this, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. This is in John 7. And then later on in the same gospel, John 14, John would say, The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. So the world in these two verses that I just read, along with the world in John 3.16, The one that God loves so deeply represents an entire planet of people who are dying in their sin and without any hope of salvation on their own. This is the world that God loved. Sinners, rebels, atheists, idol worshipers, hate mongers, abusers. In this world, there's no one righteous, Paul would say in one of his writings, not one. There's no one who does right, no one who seeks after God. There's no one who, when viewed in, God's, in light of God's holiness, has any spiritual good to cling to. And yet it's this very bad world that God so loved and into which he sent his one and only son. New Testament scholar Don Carson, who's kind of regarded as one of the, the best living scholars today, he writes this, God's love is to be admired not because the world is so big, and includes so many people, but because the world is so bad. This is what makes the the love of God so amazing. Now, here's our first point this morning as it relates to the magnitude of God's love. God's love is indiscriminately inviting, beckoning those of all backgrounds, pasts, and histories to come to him. We could go a step further and say that because of God's love for the world, God actually yearns for people to come to him in saving faith. 
He desires people to come to saving faith. In fact, Jesus would say uh, later on that there's more, more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 of the so-called righteous and their actions. One sinner, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, this certainly, it certainly fuels our mission, doesn't it? If we believe that God so loved the world, then we have a message to proclaim to that world. And it is this, God loves you. God desires a relationship with you. God wants to know you, and he's made it possible for you to know him. This love of God, the magnitude of, of God, God's love, including the world. Now, God didn't just love the world in sort of an emotional but a passive way. His love wasn't lip service. He did something about it, the text tells us. He gave. God loves so deeply, so personally, so profoundly a rebellious and wicked world that he gave his one and only son. And this giving, you realize, was for the purpose of dying. When God sent his son, he sent his son on a mission. It was a rescue mission, and it was a mission that necessarily entailed the death of his son. God sent his son to die. It would be a lot like, and of course, anytime we use an analogy, you know, it's, it breaks down in, in many ways. Um, but it would be something like a father saying to his own son, I'm going to ask you to do something, and it's going to be incredibly difficult. It may even seem to be impossibly difficult. I have some enemies that deserve to die for what they've done, and I want you, my son, to go and die in their place so they can have eternal life. Now, as a father myself, I can't even begin to grasp it. I can't even begin to fathom this sort of love but I believe it. I know that God demonstrated his love in this way. I know that it's a real historical demonstration of love that we're talking about. I know it took place. Whenever we talk about something that always pops up, whenever we talk about God giving his son to die, there's a question, I don't know, objection or something that always comes up. And it's fair, and I, I accept it. It's this, why did God have to send his son to die? I hardly ever watch the Oscars. And, um, sometimes I do. I, I'll catch a little bit. The other, a uh, couple years ago, 2017, I, I caught the last hour or so of the Oscars. Do anybody remember what happened? It was, it was one of the strangest uh, scenes in, in the history of the Academy Awards show. The, at the very end of the show, for Best Picture, this is the Best Picture, uh, which is the, big, you know, the biggest award you can get, uh, they go up, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway come out, and they say the, the award for best picture goes to La La Land. And of course, all the cast of La La Land, they come up and they're high-fiving and they're hugging and some of them are even crying. I mean, this is a big deal. This is what, this is what you work for if you're make, making movies for the Academy Awards. So, and so they're celebrating, as, you know, as understandably. And then all of a sudden, you kind of notice if you're watching, there's, there's something going on in the back of the stage, and it's kind of, it's a little bit of distracting. You don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, the producers of the show come out and they say, there's, there's been a mistake. There's been a mistake. The, the, best, uh, the award for best picture doesn't actually go to La La Land. It goes to the movie Moonlight. And of course, you know, then the people who, who the cast and producers of Moonlight come up and, <laughs> I mean, it's awkward. You know, it's like, th th it's really uncomfortable. And, and then people in the stand, people in the audience, they, they have these weird looks. Here's a shot of the... Uh, a shot of the, the, the folks in the stands, you can see. Now, if you zoom in just a little bit, show the next picture. Look at the, look at the, the rock's face. I mean, I mean, he's got this look like somebody's going to be body slammed for this. And then look, Ben Affleck, you can't see, he's looking over at Matt Damon. I don't know what he's going to do, but, but he's bothered by this. And then Meryl Streep in the lower right, I mean, she's just like, she can't believe this is happening. And then if you remember what happened after that, that night... The whole sort of blogosphere and internet was set ablaze. All these, what do you call them, trollers or whatever, they're, they're, all, they're all out there and they're saying, who is responsible for this? Somebody has to pay for this mistake. Was it the person, was it Faye Dunaway and Warren Betty? Say, no, they just kind of received an envelope. They just read what they were given. Was it the producers of the show? Was it 
I don't know, Ernst and Young or whoever was in charge of that. Who is responsible? Because somebody must take, be held accountable for this. Now that was for a mistake. That was for a mistake. People recognize someone has to pay. But what happens though when it's more than a mistake? What happens when someone is actually wronged? What happens when, when our choices, my decisions, your actions bring harm to someone else? They bring disrepute to the name of God. What happens in that case? If a simple mistake, I mean, I'm assuming it was a simple mistake at an award show, causes all these people to say somebody must pay, what happens when there's a real offense committed? Well, this has been a question that humanity has always wrestled with. Regardless of what religious background you come from, proponents have always recognized that when wrongs are committed, someone has to pay for the wrongdoing. In fact, a thousand years before Jesus Christ came, uh, Greek mythology tells the story of the Trojan War. And uh, it's not a real war, it's a mythical war. But the Greeks would wage war against the city of Troy because a resident of the city of Troy had stolen the wife of the king of Sparta. And Sparta is a, a very prominent city in the Greek empire. And so you have this, maybe you, you've read about it, if you've read any Greek mythology, you have this 10-year war that goes on. It just goes on and on and on. But before the war ever got started, before things were ever really set in mo motion, at least in earnest, Agamemnon, who was the general of the Greek army, faced this major leadership crisis. His ships were being tossed and turned by the storms, and, and by all accounts, it looked like his men were going to die. So this is at the very beginning of the Trojan War, and these, these, these ships, these vessels are sailing across the sea, and the storms are so bad that it looks like there's no hope for them to actually make it. So Agamemnon, who was, again, the general of the Greek army, he faced this dilemma. And what he realizes is that Artemis, who was the goddess of the seas and the winds and the waves, she was angry at Agamemnon because of an offense that he had committed against her. And so someone suggests to this Greek general, Agamemnon, you have to sacrifice your daughter. If you will offer your daughter to Artemis, Artemis will transfer her anger from the soldiers, from you, and will direct her wrath at your daughter and will so punish your daughter in their place. Now, this is a thousand years before Jesus. So what does the Greek general do? Well, he sacrifices his own daughter to the Greek god Artemis. And according to the myth, her anger is satisfied. She relents. The winds die down. The Greeks then are able to sail on to battle Again, there's no such thing as the goddess of Artemis. This is fictional, myth mythological, but it does show how people thought even thousands of years before Jesus. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, humanity has always recognized that wrongdoing must be punished in order for justice to prevail. Someone must pay for sins that are committed. And of course, we believe that too. If a murderer and rapists were convicted of the crimes and arrested and, and you know, went to trial and convicted by a jury, but the judge said, you know what? I'm just going to let this one slide. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to let this one slide. Well, of course, we would be outraged. And of course, if it were one of our own children, can you imagine the sort of vitriol and anger we would feel? We know that Someone has to pay when wrongs are committed. Well, the question is, who's going to pay for mankind's rebellion against a holy and perfect God? Who's going to pay for all the ways that you and I have rebelled, all the ways that we have spurned God's perfect law, violated his character? Who's going to pay for all of that? Who's going to pay for our transgressions? Someone has to pay. Who's it going to be? Well, John 3.16 is the answer to that question. Because of God's love for the world, he sent his son to pay for our rebellion, not to condemn the world, verse 17, but to save the world. 
So we're going to see as the story unfolds, as we already know, by dying on a cross. See, the cross demonstrates God's character in its complexity. It shows the love of God. It shows the kindness of God. It shows the mercy of God. United with His justice, His holiness, His wrath. It perfectly demonstrates, yes, a God who's beyond our understanding, but one that we clearly see as a God of love. And the love of God is not a tolerant love. It's so much better than that. It is a redemptive love. It's not a love that winks at sin, but a love that deals with sin, fully addressing it through the cross work of Jesus, which means that because Jesus has dealt with our sin, because he has paid for our rebellion, we don't have to worry about death. It means that those who are in Christ, whoever believes will not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes. This is an open invitation to all. Whoever believes will not perish, but will have eternal life. Now, we think about eternal life. We think about everlasting life. We, we almost always think in terms of future, don't we? And, and, and the future life with God is going to be amazing. It's going to be beyond anything we can dream of or conjure up. Paul says, he says that I reckon that the sufferings we're going through in this world, they don't even compare with the, the glory that is to be revealed. So yes, it is a future life that will be absolutely incredible, amazing, again, beyond our imagination, but it's not just future. The eternal life we receive in Christ is not just future. There is a very real present aspect to it. See, eternal life doesn't simply mean to exist forever. Everybody exists forever once they're born, but not everybody has eternal life. This is a reference to those who have been made alive spiritually. And we saw this a couple of weeks ago. Those upon whom the Holy Spirit acts and makes alive, they then now have a new confidence and a new hope and a new vision. They're able to see God's work in the world. They're able to see the kingdom of God advancing. The life that the Spirit gives is life in Christ where we're able to see and savor God as glorious and unparalleled in His majesty and enjoy all of creation the way it was meant to be enjoyed. And it's a life, here's some really good news, really good news. It's a life that is lived under the banner of forgiveness. Those who believe, Jesus says in verse 18, are not condemned. This means despite the fact that we deserve God's wrath, which will be poured out on the unrepentant. Despite the fact that we deserve eternal condemnation, what we receive instead is acceptance, forgiveness, no condemnation. And instead, the righteous record of Jesus, the one who was sent to save us, is then credited to us. And this is really the biggest game changer of them all, really. When you think about it, you know, some people, they spend their whole lives really dwelling on their past. They, they, they analyze it and they, they scrutinize it and they reflect on it and they, under, they, they try to understand it. And even some situations, they even kind of relive it. And, and make no mistake, there's value in understanding and looking at how our past has shaped us. But if all we're thinking about is our past, then our past becomes central, doesn't it? Our past then controls us. Some people are so concerned about their past that they, do, they go to great lengths to actually hide their past from everybody around them, from their friends, even from their own spouse. They don't want anyone to know what they've done. And so the past then has a stranglehold on them. But Jesus says, for those who will believe, nothing we do or have done will condemn us. We've been given new life. Our past doesn't define, define us. What defines us is we've been loved by God and given new life by believing. Now, for some people, it's not their past that haunts them. It's the present. And they, they, they're caught in sin. They can't get beyond a particular sin. And, and they live with constant shame, constant guilt. And it plagues them all the time. This is the way my friend, a guy who became my friend, Phil, this college student, this is the way he lived. His life was consumed with guilt and shame. He had no joy in life. And I believe that this is also the way, this is what motivated Nicodemus to come to Jesus 
in the first place. He came at night. He didn't want to be seen. He lived with shame. He was keeping all the rules. But he was empty. Happiness had eluded him. See, for those in Christ, though, eternal life begins now. It begins with a declaration by Jesus himself that we are not condemned, but forgiven and loved. Here's our second point. The benefit of love's gift is a meaningful, purposeful, shame-free life that lasts for eternity. This is the message of John 3.16. That we don't get what we deserve, but instead we get everything that Christ secured for us by His obedience. The idea that we don't get what we deserve, is, which is grace... Grace, it's one of the, the, con, the, the themes that has motivated Bono, the lead singer and songwriter for U2, and much of his music. In fact, in an interview a, a few weeks ago, Bono talked about this. He said, it's a mind-blowing concept that the God who created the universe might be looking for company, a real relationship with people. But the thing that keeps me on my knees is the difference between grace and karma. You see, at the center of all religions is the idea of karma. You know, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, tooth, or in physics, in physical laws, every action is met by an equal or opposite one. And yet along comes this idea called grace. To upend all that, as you reap, so you will sow stuff, grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed, Because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. I'd be in big trouble if karma was going to be my final, finally be my judge. But I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins on the cross. Do you believe that this morning? That we're not we're not living in a world that's regulated by karma. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. No, we do bad, we still get good because of Jesus. We sin, we rebel, we revolt. Christ comes and he pays the penalty for it. So we actually get good news. We are loved, we are forgiven, we are accepted. Bono says that love interrupts the consequences of our actions. I love that. And I would say it another way, perhaps. God's love means he no longer views us, his own, according to our actions But he views us, he sees us according to Christ's actions. Again, all these benefits come by believing. And what does it mean to believe? Well, John defined that in John chapter 1. To believe means to receive. To believe means to receive Jesus as he truly is. It means receiving Jesus means, verse 18, believing in the name of the only Son of God, which necessarily means receiving him as he he is. A king, but also our king. Surely a savior, but also our savior. Most definitely a substitute, but also our substitute. The mediator between God and us. C.F.W. Walther, who's a 20th century theologian and pastor, writes this Faith is not merely thinking, I believe. Your whole heart must be seized by the gospel and come to rest in it. When that happens, you are transformed and cannot help but love and serve God. And that's really the point of the next few verses, which I'm only going to highlight, touch on. Not everybody, of course, receives Jesus as who he is. Many, many, or I think if we're really going to take the words of Jesus seriously, most Most people don't receive him as he truly is. Remember, Jesus said that that, that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there are that find it. Not everybody will receive Jesus. There are those who say they believe, who even verbally claim Christ as Lord, but they've never really received Christ as who he is. In other words, they're not really depending on him and his work for salvation. 
They may, they may be even doing a lot of things. You know, Jesus says in was it Matthew 7, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we do all these great things? Jesus says, no, leave me alone. I never knew you. Many will say they believe, but they never receive Christ as their Savior, their treasure, their Lord, their substitute. And Jesus offers a warning to those. Those who don't believe are condemned already, he says. In fact, it's such a sure thing that Jesus speaks about it in the past tense. Their final judgment will certainly come later, but even now the wrath of God remains on them. So if you have not received Christ this morning, if you've not turned from your sin, turned from your rebellion, received Jesus Christ as Lord, the wrath of God rests on you this morning. And that is a harrowing, frightening, devastating reality. But God so loved the world that whoever believes, you don't have to leave this morning under the wrath of God. You can believe, you can receive Jesus and be reconciled to him. Jesus says their unbelieving heart, verses 19 through 20, will be revealed by the wicked things they do and the way that they hate the light. They run from the light because the light reveals the evil of their works. However, for those who believe, those who receive the love of God through His Son, verse 21, they come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their works have been carried out in God. In other words, there's such a humility there, there's such a recognition of brokenness, such a lowliness of spirit, to use Jesus' words in a different sermon, such a gratitude for God's love, they want to show that any good deed they do... Anything they do that's of any worth is actually from God. He is the source of every good deed, even our love for him. His love comes first. And that recognition leads to grateful humility, but also a response of worship and obedience. Here's our final point this morning. God's love, truly perceived, always draws out from us a response of love, and a desire to see God glorified. This is one of the most important, one of the most paradoxical truths in all the Scripture. And it's one that's so easy for us to reject or, or ignore, and that is it's only love that engenders love. It's only love that stirs the soul to worship. It's only love that moves the heart to obedience. Law, commands, demands, imperatives, expectations, certainly they can bring about compliance. They can bring about sort of a desired response. But the only thing that can move the heart is love. And in order to capture the hearts of a broken and sin-cursed humanity, God showed His love by sending His Son a few years ago, I was preaching through Ephesians, and God brought me to this realization um, that it's only love that's going to move our hearts. And I, and I was preaching through Ephesians, and I see how Paul is he's commending the, the church at Ephesus, and he's instructing the church at Ephesus. And then in this real sort of critical moment, he says, he prays for the church. And what does he pray so that they would actually be spurred to obedience and love and worship? He says, God... I pray they have the power to, to understand, to recognize the height, depth, width of your love in Christ. And that absolutely hit me. I mean, it absolutely left me just stunned. And so that realization has changed the way that I preach, the way that I live as a husband, the way that I teach, the way that I shepherd, the way that I parent. One of my favorite things to do in life is... Uh, to tuck in bed my, my 12-year-old daughter at the end of the day. Uh, my middle two teenagers, 18 and 17, for some reason don't want me to tuck them in anymore. Uh, they think that's weird. Um, but not so much with my littlest one. We tell stories and exchange ideas. Uh, she usually demands that I shave if I haven't shaved. Um, but we have this time together, and it's really sweet. And, and after our nighttime conversations, we always pray. And for the longest time, for the longest time, my prayer for my daughter was something like this. 
Father, help Julia to love you more and to cherish you above everything else in life. And that's a fine prayer. That's a fine prayer. I want that for my daughter. But as I was working through Ephesians and I was beginning to understand how this fits together, again, something happened that, that clicked. And now, there's, now I, I, I pray in a different way. Rather than asking God to help my daughter love him more, again, which is not a bad request, but it's a bit like getting the cart before the horse. What I've learned to pray recent, over recent years is this, Father, enable Julia to understand and to know how much you love her. Help her to grasp how much you love her, to know how much you care about her, to understand the depth of your affection for her. It's a subtle difference, but I think it's an important one. One is a law-based prayer, and the other is rooted in the gospel. And here's why this matters so much. Only as we begin to realize how much God loves us will our hearts overflow with love for Him. Only as we begin to grasp at the soul level how much God has given for us in Christ will we then be able to give generously to Him. Only as we understand God's unyielding affection for us in Christ will we be moved to worship in spirit and truth. Only as we start to comprehend the radical nature of God's love for us in sending His Son to die in our place, will we be compelled to return to Him everything, our emotions, our wills, our sustained obedience. The British scholar, New Testament, uh, New Testament scholar Gary Williams says it this way, the contemplation of divine love in its biblical fullness is never something that ends in itself. Our rest in God never finds its fulfillment in ourselves but always leads us out of ourselves toward Him and toward others. The love of God for us begets love in us for Him and for others. Now let me end kind of where we started. This is, we spent three weeks in this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Whatever happened to Nicodemus? Did he ever receive the love that Jesus talked about? Did he ever understand and grasp and cling to the love of the Father? Well, we don't know exactly what happened. Did he understand the depths of God's love? I think he did. We get two more glimpses of Nicodemus in John's Gospel. In chapter 7, we see Nicodemus standing up for Jesus in the presence of his colleagues and receiving scorn because of it. Given the nature of his position, his prominence in the community, this was an act that had to be motivated by love. And in chapter 19, Jesus, uh, Nicodemus appears again after Jesus is dead, helping to anoint Jesus' body and lay him in the tomb, which was pretty crazy, really. When we think about the tone and mood and the climate of the city at that point. But Nicodemus risked it. He risked his reputation. He risked his notoriety. He risked his status among the Jewish leaders of the day. And I would say he did so because he knew that he had been loved. May God help us to understand and to rest in this so great love that would move our Heavenly Father to send His only Son to a lost and sin-cursed world. Let's pray.